I think many of us can agree that we are living in turbulent times, times of great social, political, and technological upheaval. But this is by no means the first time in US history. At the turn of the last century, there was plenty of upheaval going on, increasing industrialization, growth of urban populations, the first mechanized great war and the social and political forces behind that, and to the official ending of slavery, but the long, ruthless reach of Jim Crow. In the midst of all this, there were young black women, only a couple of generations removed from enslavement on the plantation, who were seeking to navigate the massive social changes and to forge authentic lives for themselves in the face of severe strictures. A hard task, but these women in turn became actors and authors of social change and forged new ways and means of living life differently. Their courage and perseverance brings to mind a quote from someone else, Viktor Frankl, who had to fight to survive for years and in the wake of great loss, crafted for himself a creative way forward. This is what he said. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. The women in this book are a testament to just that. So what then is it that these women who were relegated to the far fringes of mainstream social and economic life, who were treated as invisible or nothing but trouble, can teach us about how to be bold and be the change itself. Well, here tonight to tell us something about the history and the life lessons of these women is Dr. Sadia Hartman. Sadia Hartman, for her part, was born and raised in New York City, received her BA from Wesleyan and her PhD from Yale University. She is a professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University, and her major fields of interest are African American and American literature and cultural history, slavery, law and literature, and performance studies. She is the author of two previous books, Scenes of Subjection, Terror, Slavery, and Self-Making in 19th Century America, and Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route. She serves on the editorial board of the literary journal Kalu, and just for good measure, she has been a Fulbright, Rockefeller, Whitney Oates, and University of California President's Fellow. Nice. Finally, the book, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, is described in the New York Times as an exhilarating social history, and the Kirkus Review as lucid and original. It is Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow, though, who has perhaps said it best, that the book is a startling, dazzling act of resurrection. Hartman has granted these forgotten, wayward women a new life. She challenges us to see, finally, who they really were, beautiful, complex, and multidimensional, whole people who dared to live by their own rules, somehow making a way out of no way out at all. I'm in the middle of this book, and I can tell you it is fabulous. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sadia Hartman. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's good to be here. Lots of family and friends in the audience, so that's nice. I think what I'll um, do first is just read from the book to establish you know, the context. And then I think in the Q&A, um, more about my process um, will come out. And um, I guess I'll, I'll just say this to, be, uh, to begin with. I mean, I had written two books on slavery. And writing about slavery is to, you know, be in the center of a very difficult psychic territory. And so when I um, started doing the research for this project, um, you know, I was very hungry for beauty. And I think I discovered it here, but I was also surprised by the, um, the degree of kind of constraint and deprivation I also, um, you know, found myself grappling with in... Um, examining these lives in the new century. So with that said, I'm going to read from, you know, parts of the book that I think will give you some sense of its arc and its scope. So um, the terrible beauty of the slum. And can you hear me? Am I good? No. Okay. No? Yes? Okay. It's good? Okay. Better? 
Even better? Okay. okay. And Samuel, can you raise a finger at the 30 minute mark? And I just want to, I don't want to be any longer than that. Okay. You can find her in the group of beautiful thugs and two fast girls congregating on the corner and humming the latest rag or lingering in front of Wanamaker's and gazing lustfully at a pair of fine shoes displayed like jewels behind the plate glass window. Watch her in the alley passing a pitcher of beer back and forth with her friends, brash and lovely in a cut rate dress and silk ribbons. Look in awe as she hangs halfway out of a tenement window, taking in the drama of the block and defying gravity's downward pull. Step onto any of the paths that cross the sprawling city and you'll encounter her as she roams. Outsiders call the streets and alleys that comprise her world a slum. For her, it is just the place where she stays. You'd never happen onto her block unless you lived there too, or had lost your way, or were out on an evening lark seeking the pleasures yielded by the other half. The voyeurs on their slumming expeditions feed on the lifeblood of the ghetto, long for it and loathe it. The social scientists and the reformers are no better with their cameras and their surveys, staring intently at all the strange specimens. Her ward of the city is a labyrinth of foul alleys and gloomy courts. It is Africa town, the Negro quarter, the native zone. The Italians and Jews engulfed by proximity disappear. It is a world concealed behind the facade of the ordered metropolis. The not yet dilapidated buildings and decent homes that face the street hide the alley tenement where she lives. Entering the narrow passageway into the alley, one crosses the threshold into a raucous, disorderly world, a place defined by tumult, vulgar collectivism, and anarchy. It is a human sewer populated by the worst elements. It is a realm of excess and fabulousness. It is a wretched environment. It is the plantation extended into the city. It is a social laboratory. The ghetto is a space of encounter. The sons and daughters of the rich come in search of meaning, vitality, and pleasure. The reformers and sociologists come in search of the truly disadvantaged, failing to see her and her friends as thinkers or planners, or to notice the beautiful experiment crafted by poor black girls. The ward, the bottom, the ghetto, is an urban commons where the poor assemble, improvise the forms of life, experiment with freedom, and refuse the menial existence scripted for them. It is a zone of extreme deprivation and scandalous waste. In the rows of tenements, the decent reside peacefully with the dissolute and the immoral. The Negro Quarter is a place bereft of beauty and extravagant in its display of it. Moving in and moving on establish the rhythms of everyday life. Each wave of newcomers changes the place, how the slum looks and sounds and smells. No one ever settles here, only stays, waits for better, and passes through. At least that is the hope. It is not yet the dark ghetto, but soon only the black folks will remain. In the slum, everything is in short supply except sensation. The experience is too much. The terrible beauty is more than one could ever hope to assimilate, order, and explain. The reformers snap their pictures of the buildings, the kitchenettes, the clotheslines, and the outhouses. She, escaped no she escapes notice as she watches them from the third floor window of the alley house where she, say, where she stays, laughing at their stupidity. They take a picture of Lombard Street when hardly no one is there. She wonders what fascinates them about the clotheslines and the outhouses. They always take pictures of the same stuff. Are the undergarments of the rich so much better? Is cotton so different than silk and not as pretty draped like a banner across the streets? The outsiders and the uplifters fail to capture it, get it right. All they see is a typical Negro alley, 
blind to the relay of looks and the pangs of desire that unsettle their captions and hint at the possibility of a life bigger than poverty, at the tumult and upheaval that can't be arrested by the camera. They fail to discern the beauty and they see only the disorder, missing all the ways black folks create life and make bare need into an arena of elaboration. A half-dressed woman wearing a house coat over a delicate nightgown leans against the doorway hidden by the shadows of the foyer as she gossips with her girlfriend standing at the threshold. Intimate life unfolds in the streets. The journalists from Harper's Weekly gush in print, quote, Above the Jews, in the same tenement houses, amid scenes of indescribable squalor and tawdry finery, dwell the Negroes leading their light-hearted lives of pleasure, confusion, music, noise, and fierce fights that make them a terror to white neighbors and landlords alike, end quote. Aroused at the sight of elegantly clad domestics, janitors, and stevedores, elevator boys in rakish hats preening on the corner, and aesthetical Negroes content to waste money on extravagance, ornament, and shine. The sociologist urges them to learn the value of a dollar from their Jewish and Italian neighbors. Negroes must abandon the lax moral habits, sensual indulgence, and careless excess that are the customs of slavery. The present past of involuntary servitude unfolds in the street and the home, which was broken completely by the slave ship and the promiscuous herding of the plantation, is now broken again, broken open in its embrace of strangers. The senses are solicited and overwhelmed. Look over here. Let your eyes take it all in the handsome thugs lining the courtyard like sentinels, the immoderate display of three lovely flower pots arranged on the sill of a tenement window, the bed sheets, monogrammed handkerchiefs, embroidered silk hose, and whore's undergarments suspended on the line across the alley, broadcasting clandestine arrangements, wayward lives, carnal matters. Women with packages tied in paper and string flip by like shadows. The harsh light at their backs transforms them into silhouettes. Abstracted dark forms take the place of who they really are. The rag seller's daughters idle on the steps that descend to their cellar flat. The eldest is resplendent, sitting amidst the debris in her Sunday hat and soil frock. The youngest remains mystery and blur. The sun pours down the stairwell, pressing against the girls and illuminating the entrance to the small dank room, which is filled with the father's wares, rags, papers, cast off, piecework and discarded objects salvaged for future use. He turns his back to the camera and eludes capture. What you can hear if you listen the guttural tones of Yiddish making English into a foreign tongue, the round open mouth sounds of North Carolina and Virginia bleeding into the hard edged language of the city and transformed by the rhythm and cadence of Northern streets, the eruption of laughter, the volley of curses, the shouts that make tenement walls vibrate and jar the floor, the sweet music of an extended moan that hushes the ones listening eavesdroppers wanting more despite knowing they shouldn't. The rush of impressions, the musky scent of tightly pressed bodies dancing in a basement saloon, the inadvertent brush of a stranger's hand against yours as she moves across the courtyard, a glimpse of young lovers huddled in the deep shadows of a tenement hallway, the violent embrace of two men brawling, the acrid odor of bacon and hoe cake frying on an open fire, the honeysuckle of a domestic's toilet water, the maple smoke rising from an old man's corncob pipe. A whole world is jammed into one short block, crowded with black folks shut out from almost every opportunity the city affords, but still intoxicated with freedom. The air is alive with the possibilities of assembling, gathering, congregating. 
at any moment the promise of insurrection, the miracle of upheaval, small groups, people by themselves, and strangers threaten to become an ensemble to incite treason in mass. I'll uh, read one more section and maybe one of the things we can uh, talk about um, in the Q&A is the kind of the role of photographs in the book and um, the way they figure in um, building the narrative and trying to capture the experience of this urban sensorium. So I'm going to read um, a section now from um, an intimate history of slavery and freedom, which focuses on one young woman in the city, um, Maddie Nelson. It was still too early for the whores, sissies, and toughs who plied their trade at the docks. Families gathered, awaiting daughters and brothers and cousins. Thugs and gangsters lurked at the outskirts of the crowd on the lookout for naive young women in search of directions or in need of help with a heavy piece of baggage. When Maddie Nelson arrived in New York City, she was barely a woman at 15. She was a tall, thin, dark-skinned girl, the kind only a father would have ever described as lovely and the kind white people labeled a negress to make apparent their contempt and scorn. It would be a decade before the thick hair tamed in braids and pinned in a bun on the top of her head, prominent cheekbones, almond-shaped eyes, and wide, full lips would be compared to the beauty of an African mask. Even when dressed in her Sunday best, Maddie was decidedly unsophisticated. Yet, despite the not-quite-polished picture the black but comely small-town girl presented, Maddie was determined to be more than nothing. It was hard for Maddie to make a distinction between the city and freedom itself. Like those provincials and fools whom Paul Lawrence Dunbar derided in the sport of the gods as intoxicated by the subtle and insidious wine of the streets, who translated the Bowery into romance, made Broadway into lyric, and Central Park into a pastoral, and thereby failed to read the city as it really was, or apprehend it in a mode commensurate with its dangers, or properly adjust to its rhythms and demands. Maddie, looking past the cold facts and the risks, mistook the city for a place where she might thrive. The real fever of love would take hold of her, and the streets and the dance halls did become her best friends. All the sentimental causes of this rush and flight, the freedom to move, the want of liberty, the hunger for more and better, and the need of breathing room explained her presence in New York. She too would fall prey to the pleasures and dangers of the city while trying to make a feast of its meager opportunities. None of the factories, shops, or offices would hire colored girls, especially girls as dark as Maddie. Housework and laundry were her only option. It is hard to say whether it was the disappointment at the lack of opportunity or the assault of the coldest winter she had ever experienced that landed her in bed, sick for more than a month, only a few weeks after she had arrived. When Maddie recovered her strength, she found a position as a domestic at a boarding house with 23 rooms where she was the sole maid. Washing, cleaning rooms, making beds, and trudging up and down the five flights of stairs in the boarding house wore her out. She hated the drudgery and boredom, but her mother said if she wasn't going to school, she had to work. Most nights she fell into bed exhausted, too tired to think about going to the moving pictures or the dance hall. When she wasn't tired, she was lonely. The evenings were long and dull and not at all as she had imagined New York. After five weeks, she quit the boarding house and found a new job at a Chinese laundry in Bayonne, New Jersey, which was different, but no better. The days were still long and exhausting, but now spent doubled over pressing clothes. Few white girls were willing to work for the Chinese. The sexual panic about the dangers of Chinese men reached a new height 
after the body of a young white woman was found in the trunk of a Chinatown bachelor. The daily papers fed the hysteria and fueled the idea of the yellow peril by regularly reporting stories of unsuspecting girls lured into opium dens and turned into drug-addled mistresses or seduced by lonely bachelors at taxi dance halls or murdered by their lovers. The queer arrangements of Chinatown, the all-male households, were the result of immigration statutes that restricted the entry of Chinese women, and as a consequence, the brothel or another man's embrace were the most likely opportunities for intimacy, unless one looked for love across the color line. For Maddie, the Chinese laundry was just another job, a way station until something better became available. Herman Hawkins was her first friend in New York. He worked as a waiter at, in a boarding house not far from where she lived with her mother. At 25 years old, he appeared worldly, worldly to the not yet 16-year-old Maddie, who by her own admission knew nothing at all but was eager to learn. Herman boasted that he would show her everything, the Tenderloin, Harlem, Coney Island, he was a recent migrant from Georgia, so no doubt he enjoyed showing Manhattan to his city, to Maddie. Maddie looked forward to evening spent with her gentleman friend. They would go to the dance halls and parties where couples did the slow drag, funky butt and fishtail, to rags played on player pianos, and the ditties and love and trouble songs the white world derisively called coon songs. One night after such a party, they were walking home through Allen Park when Herman started talking about all the things he wanted to do to her. Maddie did not know if he started talking this way because of how they had been dancing when the lights were dimmed, wrapped up so tight in each other that the boundary between her body and his gave way to flesh, or if the seclusion of the park in the early hours after midnight encouraged him to speak to her like she was a woman, like she was his woman, like she was the kind of woman who enjoyed listening to that kind of talk. In hot pursuit of the virginal but curious Maddie, Herman described in explicit detail what a body could do and how it would make her feel. Maddie had never done any of those things before, and she tried to picture the intimate acts he described and the sensations aroused by such acts and wondered if she would be embarrassed with her bloomers down around her ankles and what his body would feel like on top of hers and if the bed sheets would be clean or if the cot would squeak when they made love like her mother's bed when she and Mr. Smith were going at it. It wasn't right for Herman Hawkins to say such things. He had never spoken to her like this before. No one had. Maddie told him to stop, and yet he continued to talk, and she continued to listen. She knew what he was saying was bad, but it also sounded thrilling. He kept on talking as if she had not asked him to stop, and instead of getting angry or upset, she just listened. Maddie was not aware that she was giving him an answer to his question and that she had said yes. Shortly after that walk in Allen Park, he convinced Maddie to remove her camisole and bloomers. It is not difficult to imagine the things Herman Hawkins taught Maddie inside the rented room of a lodging house. There were so many lessons to teach a girl who knew nothing, so much for her to discover what to do, how to hold him, how to not be embarrassed by her naked body or ashamed of her smells and the things she wanted to do. First, she had to breathe deeply and let go of the body armored in anticipation of insult and attack, surrender in consequence of pleasure, allow the body to yield to another, to be entered, join, and bridge, to risk all defense, yet not be made into the mule of the world. If a tender lover, he might have lingered kissing her mouth, traced the length of her back with his tongue, discovered the way she liked to be held. Had he been a selfish and demanding one, he would have trained her for his pleasure, instructing her how to move, what to say, when to keep her mouth shut. 
Did he force her to repeat words that humiliated and excited her? Or plead with her to admit what she wanted most but feared? Or perhaps they spoke no words at all? Were they loud? Did they even care if the lodgers next door or the spying neighbors downstairs heard them? Would they have minded if a lonely bachelor caught a glimpse of flesh or an abandoned wife savored the moans escaping the open window and made them her own? Or were they quiet and intent on denying others their sound? Did the men hanging out on the corner wink at Maddie as she made her way home? Or the women exchange knowing and hungry glances? Maddie had no other person to compare him with, no scale to weigh his respective merits and weaknesses, talents and areas in need of improvement. Perhaps his skills were little more than the accumulated lessons he had acquired from the women he had been with, women his age and older, women capable of training and directing him, women unafraid to tell him to hush and get to it. Women who expected little else of him because they also worked hard for meager wages and realized that although 25, like most colored men in New York, he couldn't afford to marry or support a family, even if he had wanted one. Had the boast of other men prodded him to lie as they did about what he could do or had done and to be as adamant about what he would never do, that is the kind of habits one indulged occasionally but never disclosed. Perhaps what mattered most to Maddie was that she had found the way to her own pleasure, had learned to enjoy the smell of herself on her hands and in his hair, found a way to lessen the boredom and diminish the hours spent waiting and trying to find a way out. Whether her lover valued her as a prize or took advantage of a gullible young woman matters less than what Maddie discovered in that room. What she wanted might actually matter, or that I want that becomes a way to cleanse the stench of ain't got, can't get, don't. It is possible that Maddie experienced this opening of her desire as a refusal of all that kept her fixed in place, stuck at the laundry, chained to an ironing board, suffocating and without any possibility of change. An unremarkable act of coitus, a deed of no import except to those involved, a routine practice not in any way to be confused with matters of significance, just an everyday act of fucking, a quasi-event, would not have been noticed had it not been a part of a greater social upheaval. Intimate acts shared in rented rooms and boarding houses and tenements throughout the city fuel the social panic about wandering, dissolute young women and the great numbers of young black people rushing to New York. Maddie's restiveness and longing and the free love practiced in her private bedroom rented by the week were part of a larger ensemble of intimate acts that were transforming social life and inaugurating the modern, which was characterized by the entrenchment and transformation of racism emergent forms of dispossession and the design of new enclosures and by a fierce and expanded sense of what might be possible. Girls on the cusp of womanhood, young colored women like Maddie were at the center of this revolution in a minor key. Despite the efforts of the state to contain it as pathology and as crime, it proved impossible to stave the tide of desires not bound by the law, coupling and procreation outside the embrace of marriage and the ardent longing to live as one wanted. A small rented room was a laboratory for trying to live free in a world where freedom was thwarted, elusive, deferred, anticipated rather than actualized. Maddie was a hunger artist wasting away before the eyes of the world for lack of opportunity while everyone gawked and watched. And like any artist with no art form, she became dangerous. Maddie was desperate not to be a servant or a drudge, but there was no ready blueprint for another life that she could follow besides the one she crafted, 
and in co-ate plan and radical thought and deed were her resources. If she could feel deeply, she could be free. She knew that beauty was not a luxury, but like food and water, a requirement for living. She loved cashmere sweaters, not because they were expensive, but because the fabric felt so exquisite against her skin, like a thousand fingers caressing her arms and the cool slip of silk undergarments against her flesh, smooth and releasing all that heat and fire, and the way a gold bracelet glinted and flashed in the sunlight and made the tone of her blue-black flesh so lush as if right below the skin there were layers of indigo and ochre, a vortex of deep black in which you could lose yourself. Beauty and longing provided the essential architecture of her existence. Her genius was exhausted in trying to live. What took place behind the closed doors of a rented room in a lodging house was a moment an iteration of the revolution of black intimate life that was taking place in New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago in the first decades of the 20th century. It was a part of the general unrest that came to define the age and the new Negro. Experiment was everywhere. It was a ubiquitous term employed to describe a range of social projects, from the settlement house to a laboratory of sociology to a model tenement, from aesthetic and scientific innovations to radical designs for living. It was a term bandied about. There was nothing precious or unusual about seeking, venturing, testing, trying, speculating, discovering, exploring new avenues, breaking with traditions, defying law, and making it, except that hardly anyone imagined that young black women might be involved in this project too. Few guessed that Maddie was trying to make something of herself, however uncertain she was about what might be and however desperate to shake loose the expectations and demands of others, which always boil down to drudge and whore, better an errant path than the known world, better loose than stuck. If it is possible to imagine Maddie and other young black women as innovators and radical thinkers, then the transformations of sexuality, intimacy, affiliation, and kinship taking place in the black quarters of northern cities might be labeled the revolution before Gatsby, before the queer men and lady lovers and pansies congregated at the Ubangi Club or the Garden of Joy or the Clam House, before the Harlem Renaissance, before white folks journeyed uptown to get a taste of the other, before F. Scott Fitzgerald and Radcliffe Hall and Henry Miller, before black communists and socialists preaching on Harlem street corners noticed girls like Maddie, eager as any to hear news of a future world, this reconstruction of intimate life commenced. After the slave ship and the plantation, the third revolution of black intimate life unfolded in the city, the hallway, bedroom, stoop, rooftop air shaft and kitchenette provided the space of experiment. The tenement and the rooming house furnish the social laboratory of the black working class and the poor. The bedroom was a domain of thought and deed and a site for enacting, exceeding, undoing, and remaking relations of power. Unfortunately, the police and the sociologists were there also, ready and waiting for Maddie Nelson on the threshold of want. So I think I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you. And so I don't know if we can just like go back and forth. I mean, clearly what I'm talking about here is this, you know, revolution of black intimate life between these years of 1890 and 1935. And that um, is basically you know, the landscape of the book and um, I guess the essential paradox that it's exploring is this, um, you know, this avid desire to make a different kind of life in the context um, of a new racial order being made and, and a racial order that's going to be as punitive 
and as restrictive as previous orders and that new order will come to understand as the ghetto. So it's this kind of this experiment that's taking place as the walls of the ghetto as a racialized formation are being erected. So with that said, I think I'm just going to open it up for questions and comments, reflections. So you talked early on about the uh, voyeuristic expeditions and how survey surveyors and photographers could have that same impact. And then later you touch on uh, about the important role of photographs in transforming the modern audience back into that space. And so if you could touch on whether you think there's a contradiction there at all, whether those things are or are not mutually exclusive, I'd love you to hear you talk more about pop photographs. And are you thinking about like the role of photography and transforming like our perceptions of the city or uh, the tension between that and photography as surveillance and regulation? Um, more the latter. Okay. And, and I think, um, you know, there are 61 images in the book. Um, and I think that, um, you know, what I often tried to do was to um, give these kind of very classic um, images of the slum. And we actually see them produce, it's a kind of a transatlantic repertoire of images of the slum and the life of the poor and um, to give them new captions, right? Because, um, you know, when I'm looking at a photograph of a, a rag seller and his two daughters, I'm not thinking of, you know, a sunken hovel in the fifth ward, right? What I'm seeing is a kind of a social world that's there. And I think that um, much of the narrative um, is also built with other images that aren't, you know, reproduced in the book, but I'm describing them and actually trying to recreate them through my, through my way of, you know, looking at them. Um, there's a, a really brilliant um, philosopher, photographer, and Ariella Azule, and she talks about the way we activate images through our watching, you know, that it's it's very active, it's not uh, a passive capacity, this um, looking, and that's what I've tried to do by um, finding uh, an archive of everyday and ver vernacular images, which tell a very different story about black life. And then um, in terms of looking at those you know, social surveys, trying to mine them so that they yield other stories. And, you know, and one of the hugest you know, kind of surveys of black life that I mine for this project but deploy to other ends are W. You know, W. B. Du Bois's um, social survey, the Philadelphia Negro, which, in some sense, inaugurates you know that um, genre of sociology on the kind of on the crisis of black urban life. But how do I um, create different stories and different kinds of you know images of black life from it? Um, thank you for that reading and for all of those fresh perspectives on um, the archives, the photos. Um, very exciting to uh, reimagine that time from a very different perspective. And um, I'm not familiar with your work, but I... I understand that it's kind of an amalgam of imagining or reimagining an historical fact. So turning it over so that we see um, a different, different side. And um, it's very gritty. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, that well, there are a couple of things, and I'm sorry if I'm not being concise, but um, the excitement about freedom is something that I've heard about in um, visits to South Africa, where people could all of a sudden, after apartheid, uh, travel freely. 
And so there's an analogy, I think, um, in that getting to the city and finding, discovering what freedom is like in this iteration. Um, so perhaps you could uh, talk a little bit about um, what insights you, what, what sparked your insights about um, looking at, at recovering things like the excitement of freedom or yeah. the excitement of, of a new agency? Yeah, that's a, um, I mean, both parts of the, of your question, um, you know, is a really, um, you know, are really good. And, and I think that in some ways that the language of movement and freedom are so tethered. I mean, uh, if we look at um, so much of the kind of, you know, liberal philosophies of freedom, freedom is often described in terms of the act of moving. And I think that for um, black people in the aftermath of both slavery and the failure of reconstruction, sometimes the only concrete way they could make good the experience of freedom was that capacity to move, right, to, to move freely. And certainly um, the, the terms that um, are used most often to describe that experience are people are literally drunk with the idea of freedom, right, that it, people are giddy with it. And the other expression is, um, you know, the rush to the city or the language of rush and flight. And I think that that's actually, um, that that rush and flight is itself um, an articulation of the meaning of freedom, particularly for those who, um, you know, um, whose only resource is the self, is their kind of embodiment. And um, so, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, I was going to say that I think that when we um, think about that in this period, which, you know, you said this is a different um, lens on this period, which is often understood as both, you know, in terms of black history, the decades of disappointment or the nadir of race relations, because what we see in the U.S. at this point, it's, you know, um, people describe the moment we're in as a second nadir. What we see is just the kind of the resurgence of this really kind of, you know, vicious racism, race riots, epidemics of rape and lynching. So that, and then we kind of get this narrative of the post-war world. So something about like, you know, the modern world is born when, you know, Zelda Sayer to be Fitzgerald dance wi you know, dances wildly in a country club in Montgomery, Alabama. Like, you know, then the modern is born. And so I think that what, um, what I'm looking at is um, this kind of transformation of the texture of intimate and social life that's taking place in the city before that, but it's just that when, um, you know, poor black people or the working class are involved in these social experiments that are a response to the context that they're in, that they're labeled crime or pathology and that they become criminalized. But when a college educated elite basically enacts the same practices like, you know, a decade or two later, then we're in something called the jazz age. And how is it that the kind of the social agents of this transformation wind up at best as a kind of like backdrop or soundtrack to a story of the jazz age or of the flapper, but in which they, you know, utterly disappear as figures. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say in terms of thinking about the movement, um, you know, Du Bois famously describes in Black Reconstruction the forces that, you know, um, ended the plantation system in slavery. And he talks about the general strike. And, and by the general strike, he means those hundreds of thousands of enslaved people who fled the plantation to the union lines to gain their freedom. And I think in a way, you know, we need to think about these young women and their acts of migration and flight as an extension of that general strike, because basically they're saying no to, to the conditions of slavery, uh, to their confinement in a, in a Southern order, to a world that only wants to conscript them to servitude.
Hello. Hi. <laughs> and thank you so much. I've been anxiously awaiting uh, your newest book, so thank you so much. And I think I want to continue a little bit with um, this idea of mobility um, uh, because it's something that I'm really interested in. And one of the things, um, and I know you're in conversation with a lot of different people, including Tara Hunter, who's kind of mined uh, this territory, Robin Kelly, a little bit, um, uh, Alexander uh, Wellier. Yeah. And so one of the things in thinking about him in particular in phonographies is I'm wondering whether you deal with the notion of technology at all um, and the way of, of mobility and technology and his insistence, thinking about Alondra Nelson as well, thinking about technology before the digital age and engagement kind of with everyday technologies. And my work is around uh, bicycling um, and mobility. And so I, I just wanted, wanted, did you have any is there anything in your book that focuses on technology in any way or, or in your research at all? I mean, I think we could think about bi bicycling as a technology, but also photography as a technology. And did you also. write an essay about black women and bicycling? I did. Oh, okay. my gosh. Okay. Um, so, uh, so um, yeah, I mean, I think um, absolutely. I think that for me, the technology that um, figures really significantly is the cinema. Mm. And um, and what um, n and again, not only as this discrete thing that makes possible a vision of like black modern life, but almost um, cinema itself mm -hmm. as a kind of um, a sense of what might be possible. And I there's mm -hmm. a tension between those uh, reformer photographs of the slum that attempt to like fix and arrest life mm -hmm. and the articulation of black modernity um, in the cinema. Mm -hmm. And there's a way that, um, you know, Oscar Michaud, mm -hmm. um, you know, specifically, but just the, f the figure of like the black cin cinematic is one of the ways mm -hmm. that um, this modern experiment is articulated. Mm -hmm. Good. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I know it's always so intimidating when you have to walk all the way up to the mic. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, what uh, is really important for me, um, you know, about this book and uh, and thinking about and working with the photographs is that I try to recreate that experience of the urban sensorium so that there is a kind of, um, there's a central character to the book that there's, you know, you're listening to the soundscape of black life. And, and a lot of that is um, inspired and drawn from um, some of these, you know, the photographs, right, that I try to recreate the texture of it, because I don't want you to look at this world um, as the reformer does. And certainly that's not the space from which the book is written. I mean, in the beginning, I say, this is a story that's written from inside the circle of the chorus, right? So that the reader should feel um, situated within it. And so thinking about the, the opening chapter, the terrible beauty of the slum and this young um, woman who's making her way through those um, those alleys and side streets of Philadelphia. I mean, there are like, you know, the thousands of, you know, photographs that I've looked at at those places. And there are, you know, 700 photographs of like laundry hanging from a clothesline. Like, you know, so, so literally people do they take the pictures of the same, 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 same stuff all the time with the idea that that actually tells us something about the life of um, working folks or that that tells us something about the life of black people. So um, when I started, you know, writing the book, I wanted to find those, you know, photographs of, you know, young women hanging out on the street or talking to one another, um, you know, across the alley. And those were much more difficult to find. So um, in, you know, as I narrate here, there's a photo in the book. Um, the caption of it is typical Negro alley. But if you look closely, you see a figure 
peering out of, you know, the third floor window. So even as the reformers are staging their own vision of the slum, people who are living there, they're looking back, right? And so it's not just that there's that powerful structure and gaze. There are a variety of looks, and, and many of those looks are critical of that project. I'm really excited that you're here. I actually just um, stumbled upon the New York Times review of your book, maybe Thursday, and then searched on it and discovered that you're going to be here. So it's just really nice that the timing worked out. Um, so I don't really know much about your previous work or even this book. I, I'm really interested, though, to know about the primary sources that you had access to and, um, you know, your approach. I'm very interested in just how, where where did you have to, what was the jumping off point where you said, this is all I can find and now I have to use my imagination, creativity, or sort of connect these dots. I'd just love to hear more about that process and, and how far, where do we... Where do we stop? Where do we stop? Yeah, Thank and, you. and that was um, raised in the previous question. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, my previous books were um, written about slavery and, um, and in many cases you're dealing with like the absolute dearth of archival materials that are, you know, um, render the experience of the enslaved. So there was, you know, dearth. In this period, because social reformers are so invested in, you know, um, mapping the lives of the poor, it's almost like the opposite. You have tons and tons and tons of records. So I can tell you, like, you know, the amount of cubic the cubic square feet of circulating air in the average tenement dwelling, right? Because so there's that excess of, you know, um, information and detail. But uh, so it was a matter of like, oh, so then how do I use it to um, inhabit um, a subjective or embodied experience, right? So basically, even if you have people on the street, the the account of the surveyor is often about like all the buildings behind them and they are effaced and they disappear. Um, so I have like, so there, there are like, there's a lot of archival material in fact, and with some of the records, because, you know, in this period, there's the notion of like, the therapeutic state. So basically, in terms of, you know, a reform project, in terms of, you know, uh, progressive reformers trying to create like the ideal prison, there's the notion that um, sentencing um, and all these things should be tailored to the individual. Um, and so in the effort to kind of to meet up social solutions with individuals, they collect a lot of personal material so that the state uh, and state officials create these extensive biographical files of their subjects. And so I did have a lot of material, um, you know, to use in the story of Maddie. I mean, in the file, there was a family history that went back into slavery in terms of, you know, the crossing of her family the water being stolen from Bermuda to Virginia. So the files contained a great deal of material. Um, we know from Maddie's, you know, practices that um, she continued to have lovers. So there's no description of what that intimate space was like. So that, um, so then that's about a kind of a speculation and imagining or with, I don't know if some of you said the, the New Yorker, there was an excerpt that's a reading of this photograph of, you know, a young African-American girl who was photographed by Thomas Eakins. And um, we don't know anything about this girl, right? And so, in, I mean, it was interesting because um, there, there was a kind of dance and struggle between um, myself and the fact checker. And, um, you know, we know that in, um, you know, Aikens has another photograph of an older black woman, um, old Margaret. She was probably, um, you know, a maid in the household. Um, it was a it was a platinum print, which means that it's an important print. It wasn't like a cheap album print. And so for me, um, you know, she's a, a black servant. So it's not as if there's any material about her. Um, in the book, I describe her 
being in the house as the girl walks up the stairs. And for me, it was just about thinking um, about the violence that's taking place as she was there, as the Irish housekeeper was there. Um, but because there was nothing that said that she was exactly there on that day. And that was a moment where like, that wasn't a wild leap of imagination for me, right? And I think that, or thinking about like, you know, what did this girl tell her friends about her, her experience? So the things that couldn't be quote unquote substantiated were those moments that were about trying to imagine her in the context of black social life and having other black people around her. And it was really, um, you know, interesting because the very earnest, you know, and dedicated young fact checker, you know, said, you know, I'm going to just like, you know, call the Getty and see what they know about old Margaret because they have a photo of her. And I was like, well, you know, tell me what you find. I've been working on this for eight years. Um, I don't think you're going to find anything. So I think at those moments, we see the way, um, you know, and Michelle Rothschiro has a great book called Silencing the Past. And he says, you know, relations of power impinge on every moment in the making of history and power enters into the making of the fact, right? It enters into the collection of the facts, those, this, the assembly of those facts into a narrative in the interpretation of that. And so there's moments when things drop out and specifically if those things drop out um, because of power relations, right? That might be a moment that I really then want to speculate about because there's a social relationship or a kind of violence that has made something disappear. Usually my, um, my method requires kind of borrowing from other archival sources or just, you know, um, recentering. I mean, and again, the cinema comes in here. It's kind of refocusing the lens, because usually our lens of the camera is focused on the great individual, the representative, you know, man, um, the political actor. And my camera turns and it focuses on the crowd and is thinking, well, so what's the, what are the stories or the desires or the longings of those people who are listening to the speaker on the corner? I mean, clearly there's an some identification, there some shared aspiration. So it's about ways of trying to bring the multitude into the story. And I think that that's particularly important in thinking about radical projects. That